Well, thank you, everyone, for tuning in to our program today. You may know that Family Talk is a listener-supported program, and we remain on the air by your generosity, literally. If you can help us financially, we would certainly appreciate it. God's blessings to you all. That's right, Dr. Dobson. And friend, thanks to generous listeners like you, Family Talk can reach more and more listeners with practical help and encouragement. To support Family Talk with your best gift, go online to drjamesdobson.org or call 877-732-6825. Today on Family Talk. Colleges and universities in America used to be places to explore truth with the ability to receive an unbiased education, which you could use to find a solid job. Now these places of higher learning have allowed moral relativism to dictate their every move and shifted their focus to attacking people's values. Today you're going to hear about an organization called the Leadership Institute that is inspiring young people to stand up for their Judeo-Christian beliefs and properly educating them on how to get involved in the political arena as well. Hello and welcome to Family Talk with your host, as always, psychologist and best-selling author Dr. James Dobson. I'm Roger Marsh, and Dr. Dobson will be joined in studio today by Morton Blackwell, a friend he made during the Reagan administration years over 30 years ago. After spending time in the White House in the mid-1980s, Morton felt compelled to fight for the minds of young people, so he started the Leadership Institute. On the first part of their conversation, Morton will give examples of Christian and conservative principles under attack on college campuses and how his organization is fighting back against them. Well, there's a lot to get to, so here now is part one of Crises on Campus on this edition of Dr. James Dobson's Family Talk. We're going to be uh, discussing uh, some really important topics today with a man that I've known for a long, long time. I have great respect for him. His name is Morton Blackwell, and uh, I want to tell you where we met. I had started an organization called Focus on the Family, which had a radio program, and several years later, I was uh, not happy with something that Ronald Reagan was doing. I don't know what it was. I don't remember, but it had something to do with children and with something going on in Congress. And I had the audacity to uh, write the White House and ask if I could talk to uh, President Reagan about it. And uh, you know that they did not allow that, but they said, we have somebody here as an assistant to the president, and you can talk to him if you would like, and it was you. <laughs> and I came to the White House, and you and I sat and talked for about 45 minutes. Right. Well, you were very gracious to me and very young. I was only 41, 42 years of age, and you gave me the time of day and listened to my concerns and uh, I went away feeling satisfied that things were in good shape. Later on, I recall that I was helpful with with you and Mrs. Thompson on the the uh, National Day of Prayer. Uh, yeah. We had a meeting in the White House to, to which you were invited where we had 125 different religious organizational leaders, including yourself. I do remember that. I went on to work with him for four or five years. Uh, not long after I met with you, I got an invitation to come spend a uh, morning with him and sat by him in the cabinet room. And uh, I, he turned to me and asked if I would make some recommendations to him for how to strengthen the family. And I made four recommendations uh, that day. Uh, Jimmy Baker called and asked if I'd put them in writing and all four of them became executive orders by the president. Wonderful. Uh, of course, Clinton deleted them all, so they're sure. gone too. But uh, I want to ask you, if, if you were at the White House on the last morning that Ronald Reagan addressed his staff and said goodbye to him. Uh, no, I, I wasn't. I was there for the first three years of the Reagan administration, and I was a special assistant to the president and uh, with responsibility to represent the president with several categories and groups, including all the religious leaders, all the conservative leaders, and all the armed services veterans leaders. So I was yeah. there, and, and then after three years, 
uh, I left to go off and form and build my own organization, the Leadership Institute, which I've been doing ever since. But that was the end of January of 1984. And uh, the rest is history because the Leadership Institute has gone on to have great influence throughout the country. It's in every state, isn't it? At Absolutely. This time? All right. That's what I want to talk to you about because it deals with the sons and daughters of the people who are listening to us. You've been very concerned since that time about the fact that there was an effort to twist and warp and make very, very liberal the hearts and minds of students who were going to large universities and the most influential colleges in the country. Was that what led you to start this, a concern for the moral uh, character and understanding of right and wrong by students. There's no question that that was a major motivating force behind uh, what, what I did then and what I've done through my life. There was also uh, motivating me strongly the dangers that uh, civilization faced uh, from communism. and. You remember those days, every oh, yes. two or three years, another country turned turned communist. And so that was one of the things that motivated me and a lot of other people, including President Ronald Reagan. Yes, and we all know the results of that battle. That's right. Because he, more than anybody else, he helped to overcome it, didn't he? He sure did. But the Institute took hold in those days. Yes. And uh, you showed me the last time we talked a graph that showed the number of students that you have uh, dealt with through the years. So what is that number now? Well, the Leadership Institute offers 47 different types of in-person training, and we have trained, uh, since I founded the organization, 197,000 people, over 12,000 people last year. Isn't that incredible? And the Lord has blessed it. Yes, yes. I have uh, a note here uh, that I think came from you, but it's about the University of Tennessee. Oh, yes. Let, let me read this. These are, I think, your words, and then I want you to elaborate on it, okay? All right, sure. The University of Tennessee, a few years ago, hired someone to be the vice chancellor of diversity and inclusion. There's the clue to what they wanted him to do. And if you know anything about diversity and inclusion, you know it's not something we're likely to feel good about. And he was the person they hired to set out to corrupt the students yes. and the university. The vice chancellor went around pressuring the staff not to hold Christmas parties and to be sure not to play games uh, like Secret Santa that would be seen as endorsing religion. He brought graphic sex week events to the campus, yep. which promoted a culture of promiscuity and included sessions taught by women from pornographic films to coerce students to get on board with political correctness. He said the students should not assume someone's gender by their appearance and to be prepared to use ridiculous pronouns like XE and XEM and XYR and variations of yes. male and female and men and women. Yes. Uh, that was going on. Now, you took that on. Absolutely. We have a website, a, a campus news website at the Leadership Institute. It's called campusreform.org, and we expose every day on that website leftist abuses and bias. And we ran that story, and it ran nationally. It, it has a, a wide uh, audience, including a lot of people in Tennessee, and they saw it, and they started putting pressure on the the state legislature for this absurd counterculture uh, program. And the state legislature took care of it. They defunded this. They cut out over $400,000 that had been allocated for this diversity and inclusion 
program, and they put most of it into a scholarship program for engineering students, but they took a little bit of it out. The state legislature uh, took a little bit of that money to purchase bumper stickers to put on the cars of campus police, and the bumper stickers read, In God We Trust. Oh, my. And that was a result of... That's the resu- a result of, of exposing things. So much of what the left does, uh, they get away with because they have a captive audience uh, on, on campus. But when it is exposed to the public, it is so outrageous that it cannot be defended and often can't be sustained. Describe for us what happens with uh, parents that have a conservative philosophy and live by it, and most of them being conservative Christians, I would think. Yes. They bring their kids up to understand right and wrong, and uh, then send them off to these uh, secular universities, usually state Universities are the large, most prestigious uh, uh, schools, and they arrive there for orientation, which I understand you have called disorientation. Exactly. What happens yes. to those bright-eyed kids who were smart enough to get into these schools? Mm-hmm. What takes place there in well, the or opening it, it, it's, it's horrifying. It. Uh, when when our son many years ago went to Virginia Tech University, my wife and I took him down there, and there was orientation for the students, and simultaneously there was orientation for the parents. At the end of the day, we met with our son, and he was just horrified that any expression supporting traditional values was Uh, the object of immediate attack, and it was clear that if you wanted to fit in on that campus, you had to abandon traditional morality. And they made fun of them and put all kind of pressure on them. And students have, I think, the most highly developed herd instinct of any segment of the society. If they sense that their peers are doing something or have some opinion or behavior practice, they feel a compulsion to, to fit in. Younger kids don't have that, and when you get older, you don't have such a a compulsion. But kids of student age, late high school and college students, feel an instinctive urge to fit in with the other students. I mean, if a kid comes in and says to his parents, I need to have $200 for a new pair of tennis shoes, and the parents said, no, uh, you can get a perfectly good pair of tennis shoes for $40 or or $50, and they'll say, oh, I just have to have this expensive uh, pair of, because everybody else is wearing them. Any deviation from the group think exactly. Is exactly. A, it's a serious breach of et- etiquette, and, and that is what the school administrations that are controlled by left understand. And so they set up an environment where the thing to do is to abandon the principles uh, and morality that people were taught at home and taught at church. Why would a university want to support something called Sex Week? I mean, well, why would they want to deliberately distort and twist and undermine the value system that was taught to these young people at home? Well, I think that a lot of those people genuinely hate our society and culture. And things that you and I consider the most valuable and important and worthwhile aspects of our culture, they hate and they want to figure out ways and means uh, to undermine those things. So they dislike the morality. Many of them seriously dislike and are ashamed of and want to fundamentally change our country. Mm. And, and this was really what you saw when you started the Leadership Institute. Right. You were worried about that, among other things. Yes, sir. Tell us what's going on on the campuses today. It's far worse than it was then. It, it, and it, it, what it, took it, place it, it, at it, the it, University it, of Tennessee is repeated all over the country. Time and time again. However, 
when public attention is called to it and the pressure comes, and if it's a private school, the alumni or the donors, if it's a public school, alumni, donors, and state legislators get upset about it. We've had in uh, the last six or seven years, we've had 130 victories that are really? that are similar to that which I've told you. Now that doesn't solve the problem on on every campus, but w- when you said earlier that things are worse now, in some ways, in the past couple of years, it got to the point where the left made an announcement or made announcements that they were going to prevent any conservative speaker from appearing publicly on the college campus. And they were prepared to disrupt. They were prepared for violence. They were prepared to destroy uh, property. They were prepared to beat up people. And they start, did it really starting in the fall of 2016. This group Antifa uh, deliberately announced that they're going to stop conservatives from speaking. Is that, that the, the one that took place at Berkeley? Y- yes. Well, Antifa is bigger than that. They're there around the country. So what we do, what the Leadership Institute does, is maintain contact with students that we know, students we have trained on campuses ac- across the country, and we in- constantly encourage them to keep their eyes open for rotten things that happen, leftist abuses and bias on their campus, and then they report to us. Uh, this year we had 92 students who across the country who had been trained uh, to be what we call campus correspondents, and they call in material, uh, uh, stories and factual things. And we wind up having those stories appear well done on campusreform.org, our campus website, and it gets picked up. News media cover it. In April, Fox News alone ran stories from campus reform 29 times on that cable news network. And we had coverage elsewhere, but... All right, so you fight it with publicity. Do you also fight it legally? Absolutely. Have you been in the courts to defend freedom of speech? We we have been. um, On February 5th of last year, I invited the representatives for 15 conservative and pro-freedom national groups that have campus chapters to come to a meeting at the Leadership Institute that I hosted. And my organization has good relationships with these people because they send their membership and their staff to us to be trained. And we frequently uh, provide them with brand new chapters because I send field reps out on college campuses to find uh, conservative uh, thinking students and encourage them to start groups. So I called them in and said, things have changed. Number one, the left has made this announcement that they're going to shut down all conservative speakers on college campuses across the country to the extent that they can. And the public is already outraged with their announcement and the violence that they have already perpetrated on campus. The other thing that has changed is that the Leadership Institute's field work and the field work of these groups, and we had 12 national groups represented there, your own groups have started new clubs. And here's some good news. There are today literally thousands more conservative and pro-liberty student clubs on college campuses than there were just a few years ago. The Leadership Institute has currently 1,990 of these groups that are in an informal network with us. Many of those groups are uh, affiliated with other groups, such as the Federalist Society or the Intercollegiate Studies Institute or Young Americans for Liberty or, or, or Students for Life. They're amazing that there are that many. Everybody has heard of the Federalist Society, which is the conservative law student operation, but there are also local clubs called the Benjamin Rush Institute. And Benjamin Rush was the founding father of the country who was a doctor, and the the Benjamin Rush group is conservative medical students. They're going to medical school. So I said, with those changes that we now have, I suggest that in the school year 
2017 uh, to 2018, let us be prepared and let's dramatically increase the number of public programs presented on college campuses. Let's go to these thousands of clubs that we have and urge them to put on a speaker, which they can do if they are a recognized student group. And even if we do nothing more than have many, many more speeches on campus, that in itself will be desirable because students will hear conservative principles spoken on campus that they've never heard on campus before. Our listeners are going to begin to understand why I respect you so highly and why I invited you to come and be with us today because I've seen through the years the impact that you've had on uh, the college campuses and elsewhere, uh, even those younger than than college age. Right. And I shudder to think where we would be if you had not been doing what you're doing. Well, let me, let, let me tell you what my second point was to this group that met February 5th of last year. I, the second thing is, let us be prepared when we bring a conservative speaker on campus. Let us have several of our students with these smartphones that can take videotape, and let's be prepared when the left starts breaking the law, when they beat up people, where they destroy property, where they shout down uh, speakers. Let us be prepared with this evidence and hold these people accountable, literally to make them pay. And so I had there in the room at the time with these representatives of these dozen national groups, I had representation of the Alliance Defending Freedom and FIRE, the Foundation for Individual Rights in Education, which also uh, defends uh, students whose rights are being abused. And I said, these people are here and they are ready to provide free legal representation to student victims of this leftist uh, uh, abuses on the, on these campuses. And we did in-person training. I did four uh, nationwide webinars teaching people who were putting on programs for the first time how to put on a public program and how to raise funds to bring a speaker to campus, et cetera. And so in the school year that is now completing, um, we've had 2,300 plus campus speakers who have uh, really? come on campus, and the word spread, because there's no way for us to do this program secretly. These national organizations communicated to their local club members, and we publicized the training programs that the Leadership Institute was going to be doing. So the left knew it, um, and maybe that is why there were only 45 occasions in this school year when the left came and disrupted, tried to shut down public programs. There are currently pending 11 lawsuits um, with free representation for the conservative victims of these students. There have been two law uh, cases that have been uh, decided, and one of them gave an $11,000 award to the victims. The other one was a $55,000 award to the student victims, and there are 11 other pending suits now. Uh, the left hates this. Uh, there have been repeated articles in the Chronicle of Higher Education, which the academics all read. Uh, there's a lot of email activity among the left, and one leftist was warning leftist professors, be careful what you say in class, because <laughs> what you say at 3 o'clock, the Leadership Institute's campus reform will get on Fox News by 8 p.m. So, <laughs> Well, I knew this conversation was going to go by in a hurry but because it's it's one that lights a lot of fires and uh, you've done such great uh, work through the years and for you to take the time to come and be our guest uh, I appreciate it and I think that those who uh, heard you articulate these things today are going to want to support it now I got other things I want to ask you and I would like you to stay for another day and we will get into those things. Would you be I'd willing be, to be I'd with be us I'd be honored. It would be a great pleasure. God's blessings to you. Thank you.
Well, that is a good place for us to stop for today. You've been listening to a great conversation Dr. James Dobson had with Morton Blackwell from the Leadership Institute here on Family Talk. Learn more about this organization and how you can get involved by visiting today's broadcast page at drjamesdobson.org. As we close for today, did you know that our ministry is completely listener-supported? We rely on your generous tax-deductible financial contributions to continue in the work the Lord has called us to. If you're able to make a monetary donation to Family Talk, remember you can do so over the phone by calling 877-732-6825. You can also make a secure gift online by visiting drjamesdobson.org. Thanks so much for your consistent support and your prayers for Dr. Dobson and this ministry. I'm Roger Marsh, thanking you for joining us today. Come back again tomorrow to hear part two of Dr. James Dobson's conversation with Morton Blackwell right here on Family Talk. Family Talk is not associated with Focus on the Family.